I'll give another minute for students to log in and then I'm gonna begin. Okay, let's begin. Uh, before I share the screen, let me say that I've done some grading. Oh, I know I did worksheet for lab nine. I just finished that. I got worksheet for lecture, I think 8A and 8B graded. For lab nine, it's only the first grading. I believe I finished the second grading for worksheet lab five, but I have not done the second grading for worksheet lab six, seven, and eight. We'll try and get to those this weekend. There's something else I did. I did the unknown notes. <clears throat> Um, it was one of the quizzes. Quiz 3A. Oops, I got that graded. Never started on quiz 4A. I'm checking just a minute here. Yeah, I've started on quiz 4A, but I'm only about halfway finished. Uh, let me uh, shut down the gradebook now and share my screen. There we go. I've updated the announcements for the Clark College Resource of the Weeks. They want me to put out each week another, what do you call it, Resource of the Week. And I just decided, you know, it changes every term and I've got to do this every week. I just put on a link going to the Resources of the Week. So if you click on that link, it will open up a page listing the Clark College Resource of the Week for that term. And they don't have them, but there's week one, week two. So the last one they sent was on the vaccine requirements. I think now they're requiring that you prove that you've been vaccinated, but I don't remember what it is. You can look at it. And then there's a penguin pantry if you want, Clark College will provide food for at least some students for Thanksgiving. And I think you have to come to Clark College to get the meal. It's gonna be made by the, um, oh, what do they call that? The um, chef school who run the pastry and cafeteria at Clark College. Uh, one other announcement I want to mention, where is it? There it is. Uh, Roberto, who teaches microbiology, wanted me to uh, announce that he's going to have two antibiotic courses winter term. And these courses, they're microbiology courses, but they're in antibiotics. They're going to be having students look for new antibiotics. Uh, the labs will be in person. Uh, the lectures will be online. And they're going to be running for winter and spring term. So if you want some more microbiology class or antibiotics class, you can take 105 and 106. I think both of these classes do not have any requirements. And you can take 106 regardless of taking 105. Uh, but uh, they will teach you a little bit more of microbiology. Okay, any questions? If not, I'm going to go to uh, our uh, syllabus and say that uh, today is uh, uh, November 16th, and we are covering 
chapter 14, which I think we already started on, Principles of Disease. Note that uh, tomorrow, on Wednesday, we have our last quiz. It'll be quiz five. And it's only covering chapter eight and lab nine. So this quiz will cover less material than most of the other quizzes, although chapter eight is a big chapter. So genetics and then lab nine, which I have the first grading of it done. There is no lab today. I will be meeting uh, for uh, 15 minutes from 6.30 to 6.45 to answer questions. If you don't have questions, you don't need to show up. All right, if there's no questions, I'm going to proceed with the lesson. I'm not hearing any questions, so let's move on. All right, we were talking about the human microbiota and the normal locations you can find it in the human body and how it differs from the transient microbiota, which will be present on an individual or in their mucous membranes uh, for days, weeks, or months. But unlike the normal microbiota, it will not be found uh, nearly forever on the patient. Uh, humans, when we look at the normal microbiota and their human host cells, humans have about one times 10 to the 13 human body cells. And we have one times 10 to the 14 bacterial cells in and on us. And so we have many more bacterial cells than we have human body cells. And that begs to ask the, answer the question or ask the question, are we more microbe than we are human? And obviously by numbers, that answer is yes. Don't let that freak you out too much. Here are some pictures of the normal microbiota, the orange cocci, uh, bacteria on the nasal epithelia, uh, which is, this is the human nasal cells down here, uh, bacteria on the lining of the stomach, there's the stomach, there's the bacteria. And then there's many bacteria in the large intestine. We're seeing both cocci and bacilli in the intestine. And I would assume that's food or material. Recently, or fairly recently, meaning it doesn't go back 20 years, but it does go back 10 years now. We've discovered the human microbiota in some recent or fairly recent uh, strange locations that we didn't know had human microbiota. Like for example, <clears throat> they've discovered that human females have a normal microbiota in their bladder. And we're talking about adults. I don't know if they've looked at this in children, that there is a normal microbiota in the female bladder. I don't know if that's the case for males. It may not be for males because their urethra is longer. And so they may not have bacteria that get up into the bladder. The study only looked at females. Uh, they also found normal microbiota in mother's milk and discovered that that isn't coming on the milk coming out, that is actually in the breast tissue, that there is normal microbiota in the female breast tissue. And so that the mother's milk has a normal microbiota with it. 
And this one, I'm not sure why it was so uh, strange and such a surprise, but they found that the normal human placenta has a normal uh, microbiota associated with it. And why I say I'm not sure why that's a surprise, because the uh, female reproductive system is open to the outside. And so um, I I'm, I'm just surprised that they didn't consider that the placenta would have a normal microbiota. Anyway, those are locations that we didn't know 20 years ago had bacteria and they do. There is a relationship with the normal microbiota and the host. Not only does the normal microbiota live on us, but it also helps produce vitamins, helps us digest our food, like E. coli. If we didn't have E. coli in our gut, we would not fully digest the food in our intestine. Uh, the normal microbiota makes us certain vitamins. I think it's vitamin B9 and something else which I've forgotten. Um, the normal microbiota helps us make vitamins. The normal microbiota also helps us in preventing pathogens from getting established. The normal microbiota can have microbial antagonism with other bacteria, such as, as uh, pathogens. And microbial antagonism is where two species compete with each other for space, for resources, and then just for the niche. The normal microbiota can prevent the growth of pathogens. That is why Usually you have to be exposed to large numbers of bacteria before you can get a gastrointestinal disease from that bacteria. One or just a few species, or if not one or just a few bacteria cells will not be enough to become sick. Even with salmonella, you need a large number, although with salmonella, I think it's something like 500 and then you tend to get sick. But for other things like a bad species of E. coli, you need large numbers of them before you become sick. And I'm talking about E. coli 0157H11 or 111, a human pathogen, not the normal E. coli, which they don't give it in a number. Uh, the normal microbiota can occupy the niche, like on our skin, for example. I have lots of normal microbiota on my skin. So if a human pathogen were to come, the space is already occupied, so the human pathogen cannot get established. The normal microbiota can also compete for resources. If there aren't enough resources, then the human pathogen cannot grow and get established. The normal microbiota can change the environment like producing acid, uh, both in um, our urethra and on our skin. The normal microbiota make it more acidic and that means it's less likely that a human pathogen can survive in that inhospitable environment. The normal microbiota can also produce bacteriocins, which I think I've talked about briefly. A bacteriocin is a protein produced by a bacteria that acts like an antibiotic. However, this antibiotic is very narrow in its action. So a bacteriocin from E. coli would only prevent species like Salmonella and Shigella from growing. They would not prevent something like intero, I'm trying to remember, Enterobacter felicium, that's not right. There's Enterobacterium aerogenesis or aerogenes. 
um, it wouldn't prevent Citrobacter ferendi from growing because the species is too different from E. coli producing the bacteria sin. But Salmonella and Shigella are very similar to E. coli, e. coli. and so E. coli's bacteria sin prevents the growth of Salmonella and Shigella. Bacteria sins would be a very good antibiotic to use. Like if somebody has a Salmonella infection, you could give an E. coli bacteria sin and then prevent salmonellaosis. And I often wondered why bacteria sins aren't used as an antibiotic. And I discovered that they are being used experimentally as an antibiotic. But the reason why you want to use a bacteria sin if you have like a salmonella infection is the bacteria sin does not prevent the growth of other bacteria. Like I said, C. ferendi and uh, Streptococcus epidermidis. Whereas an antibiotic, which is broad spectrum, like tetracycline, would. And so we would want something like a bactericin because it's so narrow in its spectrum of action. Any questions about any of that? All right, probiotics are food that we consume or, or a, uh, I don't know, a probiotic, a, a pill or something that gives us live microbes to the body. And they're ingested or applied to the surface and they're intended to exert a beneficial effect. A very good one actually is yogurt with live bacteria. Uh, it's well known that women who take uh, yogurt, who eat yogurt with live uh, bacteria in it, are less likely to get a yeast infection. And so probiotics are something which has come into favor now in the medical community. Uh, frequently, they will tell you after you take antibiotics to uh, eat yogurt or take a probiotic to reestablish the bacteria in your gut that the uh, antibiotics knock down. The relationship from the normal microbiota and the host is that they live together in symbiosis. Symbiosis is just two different organisms or populations living together. They can live in harmony, but symbiosis does not have to be in harmony. And the microbiota does live in symbiosis with its host. The microbiota lives in two types of symbiosis, mutualism and commensalism, where they do not harm the host. Mutualism is where both species benefit. And that would be something like E. coli benefits humans because the humans get the food digested by E. coli in our gut. And then E. coli gets a home as well as food from the human. So that's mutualism where both species benefit. Commensalism is where one organism benefits and the other is unaffected. And with the normal microbiota, it's actually hard to find a pure commensalist, one where they benefit, and then the human does not get any benefit. But I actually have one, and that is we have a nematode that lives in our eye, and we only have one nematode in our eye. I assume it's eating bacteria that falls into the eye, because the nematode does not damage the eye, does not eat the eye. That is a commensalistic organism because it gets a home. The human doesn't really give it food, but bacteria that fall into the eye give the nematode food. 
the human isn't damaged, so uh, that's a commensalistic relationship. Why it's difficult finding a normal microbiota, which is strictly commensalist, like the bacteria on my skin, if nothing else, it does prevent human pathogens from getting established because it's taking up the space. So that is giving us some benefit, okay? But it's not as big a benefit as E. coli, which takes up space and also helps digest our food. It might even give us some vitamins. I'm trying to remember, I think it's biotin and niacin, but I have to look that up. Uh, two B vitamins, which uh, bacteria in our gut produce, and then we get some of it. Uh, the other symbiotic relationship is parasitism, where one organism benefits at the expense of the other. A human bacterial pathogen is living in a parasitic symbiotic relationship. And that is the parasite is getting a home and is getting food from the human, uh, meaning it's living off the human cells. Uh, the human is harmed. So that's a parasitic relationship. And all human pathogens are parasitic. All right, any questions about any of that? The normal microbiota can be an opportunistic microorganism. An opportunistic microorganism is where the bacteria normally does not cause disease in a healthy individual. But under certain circumstances, the normal microbiota can cause disease and be opportunistic. Uh, such as uh, a patient receiving chemotherapy or x-rays, their immune system gets weakened, and now the normal microbiota can cause opportunistic disease. This is also true of AIDS patients where the normal microbiota can uh, cause disease. Let me see, I was gonna say something more about that. Oh, if the uh, normal microbiota is not growing where it should be, then it can be opportunistic. Like if E. coli gets into your ear and then causes an ear infection, that's opportunistic, part of the normal microbiota, but it's growing where it shouldn't be, and so it's opportunistic. So E. coli is normally found in the gut, but like I said, if it's found in the ear, causing an ear infection, it would be opportunistic. Staphylococcus aureus is found generally in the nose and the throat, and generally does not cause disease in the nose and the throat, but on the skin, it can cause disease. And Staphylococcus aureus is a human pathogen. And 20% of Americans have Staphylococcus aureus on their skin. So if you get skin ulcers or boils, uh, you might have Staphylococcus aureus. All right, any questions about the normal microbiota? Not hearing anything, so let's move on to the etiology of infectious diseases. Uh, Robert Koch was the first person to prove that a bacteria, Bacillus anthraxis, causes a, a, a disease, a human disease, and that was anthrax. And by the way, anthrax can cause disease in animals as well as humans. With that, he used that to develop Cox postulates, which this is now the third time we talked about Cox postulates. So this is an important topic. You can expect it on the final. Anyways. Cox postulates are what are used to prove that a given bacteria causes a given infectious disease. You take a sick individual 
and you grow up bacteria from that individual. You need to isolate the bacteria and get a pure culture of that. And then once you have the pure culture of the bacteria, the one that you think is causing the disease, you give it to a healthy animal. It could be an individual, but generally they do that on an animal. If the animal becomes sick, that's why the bunny is shown on its side, the poor bunny is sick, then that's a pretty good indication that this bacteria causes that disease. Cox postulates go one step further and they say, you have to harvest the bacteria that you injected into the animal that made the animal sick. You need to harvest that bacteria from the individual before you can show that that given bacteria causes a given disease. And so Cox postulates is very strict on what it does and what it can show. Anyways, we use Cox postulate to show that a given bacteria or a given organism causes a given disease. Oh, excuse me. Any question about that? There are exceptions to Cox postulates. Like what do you do with a microbe that has unique culture requirements and we cannot grow it in vitro. We can't grow it in the lab. For example, oh, not salmonella, syphilis. They've been trying oh, for over a hundred years to get that to grow in the lab and they've never succeeded. Another one is Bartonelli uh, Hinsali which causes cat scratch fever. They can't get it to grow in the lab. They don't know what it requires before it'll grow. And nobody's ever been able to figure it out. But it gets something from the human and then it can grow. So what do you do in those cases? Or what do you do in the case of uh, a disease like AIDS where you wouldn't want to inject that into a patient because the disease is so horrible. Well, what you do is you get uh, a mass of epidemiological studies and then follow those patients with time. And like initially they, they took a whole bunch of patients and followed them. And those which were HIV negative some of them, because of their own activities, became HIV positive. And then they followed those HIV positive patients with time. And they later developed um, AIDS disease. And so that's how we know that HIV causes uh, AIDS. And that's also true for uh, uh, Bartonella and Sally, that it causes cat scratch fever. There are a few other exceptions, like what do you do when multiple organisms cause the same disease signs and symptoms? Like there are many species of viruses that cause the human cold. In fact, there are three families of viruses that cause the human cold. Well, according to Cox postulate, there has to be only one species that causes that disease. And what do you do with one species of bacteria that causes multiple different diseases? Uh, an example is salmonella can cause both salmonellaosis and typhoid fever. So it's more difficult in that case to show that salmonella causes salmonellaosis because salmonella can cause two human diseases. However, in case of this case, um, both of those diseases are only caused by salmonella. And so we just 
sort of weaken the requirements in Cox postulates. And we have used Cox postulates to show that salmonella causes salmonellaosis and typhoid fever. All right, any questions about any of that? We can classify infectious diseases on whether they give or, or um, have the patient have a symptom or a sign. A symptom is a change in a body function that is experienced by a person as a result of the disease, but there's no way to measure it. So it's not apparent to an observer. So it's subjective. A good example of a symptom is a headache. Nobody else can measure the headache. You're the only one when you get a headache who knows you have a headache or can measure it. You understand what I'm talking about. A sign, on the other hand, can be measured or observed. So it's an objective measurement. Like when someone has a temperature of 102, anybody with a thermometer can confirm that that person has a temperature. So the temperature is a sign. It can be measured. But something like a headache is a symptom. It cannot be measured. A syndrome is a group of specific signs and symptoms that are characterized by a disease, such as the signs and symptoms characteristic of AIDS infection, or the syndrome of the flu, where you first get a sore throat, and then it develops into a head cold, and then you usually get a headache, and a fever, and then your body aches, then it can last for days, weeks, even uh, occasionally a month or more. Anyway, signs and symptoms are used this way by a textbook, but patients do not make a distinction between a sign and a symptom. And various doctors, uh, some do and some do not make a distinction. Classifying diseases according to disease type, there are communicable diseases, contagious diseases, and non-communicable diseases. A communicable disease is one that can spread from one patient to another. So all diseases that can spread, such as measles, tuberculosis, chickenpox, are communicable diseases. A contagious disease is a disease that Ill easily spreads from one patient to another. So uh, the colds and influenza are contagious disease. And all contagious diseases are communicable diseases but not all communicable diseases are contagious diseases. Two communicable diseases, which are not contagious diseases, are tuberculosis and leprosy. Those diseases do not easily spread from one patient to another. It doesn't say they can't spread. They do spread from patient to patient, but they don't easily spread. You need long-term exposure to uh, the agent before the disease becomes communicable and spreads from one patient to another. Whereas the flu and uh, COVID-19 and uh, measles are very contagious. A non-communicable disease is one that does not spread from one host to another, like tetanus, and botulism are both microbial diseases caused by a bacteria, but they do not normally spread from one patient to another. Any question about that? 
tetanus can spread under certain circumstances. For example, if a cannibal were to eat somebody having a tetanus infection, the cannibal may come down with tetanus. But normally, tetanus is not communicable or contagious. We can also classify a disease by its occurrence. To understand the full scope of disease, we need the details about its occurrence. The occurrence includes old and new cases of the disease. The incidence is the fraction of a population that contracts a disease during a specific period of time. So the incidence is the new cases only. Like whenever they're showing the case of COVID-19 yesterday, that is the incidence. Usually that'll be in a county in one state, like uh, Clark County, whatever the incidence was yesterday, that'll be the incidence. If, on the other hand, they give uh, both the old cases and the new cases, that's the fraction of the population having a specific disease at a given time, that's the prevalence. And usually when we see the number of uh, COVID-19 in the United States, they're giving the total number. And so that would be the prevalence both the new cases and the old cases. In uh, 2007, the prevalence for AIDS in the United States was um, over a million. And the incidence, only the new cases were 56,300. Any question about that? In the occurrence of disease, we can specify when the disease occurs. If the disease occurs sporadically, that means the disease only happening occasionally in a population, we call it a sporadic disease. Like typhoid fever in the USA, uh, many people call a spira uh, sporadic disease. Another one would be measles a sporadic disease in the United States. How we get measles in the United States is people travel to the world where measles is prevalent and then take the measles back home. And usually they get the measles, not the measles. What am I trying to say? Malaria. So malaria is a case of a sporadic disease in the United States. Uh, we have patients who leave the United States and go to a part of the world where malaria is prevalent, and then they return to the United States and come down with malaria. A good example of a sporadic disease. An endemic disease is a disease that is constantly present in a population. For example, the common cold in the United States is an endemic disease. Malaria is endemic to the tropics of the world. It's constantly present in the tropics. An epidemic is a disease acquired by many hosts in a given population over a given time period. Every once in a while in the United States, we have epidemics to the flu. And if the flu goes worldwide to other continents, more than one continent, it is then called not an epidemic, but a pandemic. Both the pandemic and the epidemic have to have a significantly more cases than normal before it will be called an epidemic if it's localized in one continent or pandemic if it's localized in two or more continents. Uh, the last 
epidemic we had was uh, COVID-19 in China, and that's quickly spread beyond China and became pandemic. Any question about any of that? Another useful way of defining the scope of, disease, of a disease is to define it in terms of its severity or duration. An acute disease is a disease where the symptoms develop rapidly. The symptoms are short-lived and then the patient quickly becomes normal, meaning no longer any disease, signs, or symptoms. An example of acute, an acute human disease is the human cold, where the disease develops quickly, symptoms develop rapidly, and then the immune response is rapid. Chronic disease, on the other hand, is a disease that develops slowly and persists for long periods of time. Example, mononucleosis and hepatitis B are chronic diseases. They develop slowly and persist for long periods of time. There is something in between an acute disease and a chronic disease. I'm not going to talk about it so you can read about it. It has a different term, but we're not going to use that term. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the disease, which does. I don't think most of you know or have heard of subacute sclerosing panencephalitis anyways. We can look at the extent of the host involvement in a disease. Infections can be classified according to the extent to which the host body is affected. A local infection is where the pathogens are limited to a small area of the body. For example, a boil or an abscess of the skin or mucous membranes is a local infection. A systemic or generalized infection is an infection throughout the body. For example, when people get the measles, that disease quickly becomes systemic and the virus can be found all over the human body, uh, largely because it's carried there by the blood. But, but um, the point is the measles becomes systemic. A focal infection is where a systemic infection that began as a local infection so MRSA is local when it is on the skin, especially only on the skin in one spot. But if it gets into the blood, it will then be spread by the blood. And there we call it a, no longer a focal infection, but a systemic infection. All right, any questions about any of that? Bacteriuremia is the presence of bacteria in the blood. This is slightly different than septicemia, which is growth of the bacteria in the blood. With bacteriuremia, all they're doing is looking for the presence of bacteria in the blood. With septicemia, they're looking for the cells of bacteria to divide in the blood. Toxemia is the presence of toxins in the blood. Uremia, the presence of viruses in the blood. The state of host resistance, or we could say the health of the host, also determines the extent of an infection. Um, the stronger the host is, the stronger their immune system is, the less extensive the bacterial infection will become. In fact, you may not get any signs or symptoms of the bacteria which has caused the infection. A primary infection is an acute infection that causes the initial illness. 
So example, if I have a boil on my skin caused by Staphylococcus aureus, that is a primary infection. It can become a secondary infection when that boil on the skin does damage to the region, and then that allows other bacteria to grow in the damaged area. And that would be an opportunistic infection if it's caused by a uh, bacteria that does not normally cause disease. You can have subclinical disease, which we've talked about before, although we used it as a, a um, asymptomatic disease, where the patient has no noticeable signs or symptoms. So there is no um, signs or symptoms of a notifiable disease. COVID-19 is a subclinical disease. And why is that? Why is COVID-19 a sub clinical disease. Well, nobody's answering, so I'll answer. And that's because many people, especially young people who get COVID-19, they get the virus and the virus is reproducing in them, but they have no signs or symptoms of being infected with COVID-19. It's estimated that about a third of Americans or asymptomatic or are subclinical in their cases of COVID-19. And that's much higher for young people, people under 30 is young, and then for uh, children and teenagers. And they're just less likely to get serious disease and they're more likely to become subclinical if they do get infected. Any questions about any of that? All right, returning to the severity or the duration of a disease, we can have uh, the disease be latent where the disease causing organism doesn't leave the patient, but it's, it's in stasis with the patient. So the patient still has the disease causing organism, but the disease-causing organism is in latency, not causing disease. Um, I'll try and come to with an example of that. I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, for latent disease, we talked about COVID-19. No, not latent. That's... Uh, asymptomatic. Uh, the best example for a latent disease is with the herpes viruses. Many of them with the virus can go latent. I'll talk about, um, which one am I going to talk about? Sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. It's not, uh, HIV-1 or HIV-2. Something like HIV four. Um, anyway, so uh, <clears throat> the example I was trying to think of is uh, chickenpox. A child becomes infected with the virus and then shows signs of chickenpox, and the virus can shed to other people at that point. But then after that, the child starts getting better. The child will go into latency where the virus that caused the chicken pox goes latent. It's, when it is latent, it's not really metabolically active. The disease causing organism is in the patient, but it's not causing disease. And the latency of chicken pox generally lasts for decades. And then the virus comes out of latency 
and uh, it germinates and takes on the vegetative pathogen. And when the vegetative pathogen goes on and infects a patient, I got a picture of that. Not seeing it though. And that can happen with uh, the chickenpox virus. It can, it hides out in the ganglia of the, the motor neurons between the spinal cord and the, the uh, muscles. But every once in a while, the virus can come out of latency and then cause disease. In the case of chickenpox, the first time you get it, the individual has signs and symptoms of chickenpox, meaning the chickenpox sore. But all other times when the virus comes out of latency, the individual will not have signs and symptoms of chickenpox. They will have signs and symptoms of, ah, drawing a blank here. Uh, they'll have signs and symptoms of shingles. And generally, most patients, the uh, disease will go away, and then the shingles will come, go away. And some patients, uh, people will have the shingles virus or the chickenpox virus come out of latency again, and then cause shingles uh, two or multiple times. So at least in Oregon, we have uh, chicken pox, and then it goes latent, and then it comes back as uh, shingles. And frequently in Oregon, the uh, shingles, when it comes back, it won't be, is that true? It will be uh, shingles. And in between the shingles and the chicken pox is the latency. Any question about any of that? Herd immunity is when many immune people are in a population. Herd immunity is vital for preventing the spread of an infectious disease. Let's look at this in a little bigger uh, outlook. Uh, here we have a patient population which is blue, mostly susceptible to the contagion. The contagion uh, infects the red individuals and then all of the people in close contact with the red individuals can pick up the contagion because the red individual is shedding that contagion and they then can become infected. Well, because uh, this region is not protected, the uh, contagion can then spread from these individuals to other individuals so that eventually, with no immunization, the population will be mostly infected with the uh, virus. However, if we have herd immunity, then the infected individuals have the virus, but the other individuals that the virus go to are all protected. So the virus cannot continue its growth. And here we're seeing a contagious disease in red, the immunized people in yellow, and this non-immunized susceptible people in blue. The uh, virus can only get to the closest blues, both which I think are in the nucleus in this case. All the other patients do not get infected. And that's because uh, the contagious or communicable agent isn't very communicable. And there's enough immunity out there, either herd immunity or vaccinated individuals, that when the virus tries to move to another individual, to a blue individual, an unprotected individual, it can't get to the blue individual because it's being uh, shed from these two individuals and it might be picked up by that barrel of oil, but that barrel of oil is not used to make this slide. Any questions about latency and herd immunity?
If not, let me state that we need to get herd immunity to COVID-19. There are two ways to get it, and that is if enough people get the vaccine, we will have herd immunity and the virus won't spread because once it gets established, it's gonna be spreading to people who are immune. And so later, most of the population will not get infected. If on the other hand, the herd immunity is not strong enough, then, then the bacteria can spread. Oops. No, that's not mine. which is shown in this graph where the bacteria sheds because there's not enough herd immunity. Uh, if you're wondering what we need to get herd immunity against COVID-19, we need 85% of the population to be vaccinated. It is true that we will get some herd immunity from people becoming infected with the virus and then building up immunity to that. However, that immunity from a natural infection of COVID-19 is less strong than the vaccine, and it's quickly dropped by individuals. Uh, that is why some people can go get COVID-19 twice, although there are different strains of COVID-19 as well. But the immunity when you get the infection is not terribly long lasting, it's much longer lasting if you get the vaccine. So the immunity with the vaccine, it should last for at least one year. We don't know exactly because they haven't studied it long enough, but the immunity they believe will last at least one year. And then the natural vaccine will last less than one year. I've heard six months and I've heard three months I'm not sure if they really know because different people have different uh, lengths to how much immunity they will have and how long it'll last. And that's true for the vaccine too. It does deteriorate with time. And that's why everyone will need a vaccine about one year after getting vaccinated and they'll know more about that the longer they study it. Uh, anyways, we aren't anywhere near 85% of the population being immune to COVID-19. I read about that, what it was. The highest vaccine immunity is something like 77%. I think it's Vermont. And uh, the virus is still spreading in Vermont. So even 77% vaccinated is not enough. You need at least 85% of the population to be vaccinated before the virus will stop spreading. And with COVID-19 Delta variant, uh, you may need higher than 85% of the population to be vaccinated. The patterns of disease takes are normally about the same regardless of what the disease causing organism is and what the specific disease is. First, there has to be a reservoir for the disease to come out of and then infect the susceptible host. So there has to be a reservoir. The pathogen has to be transmitted to a susceptible host before the host can be infected. The pathogen has to invade the host and multiply in the host. The pathogen has to injure the host. If the pathogen does not injure the host, we will have a subclinical or inapparent infection. The illness will end in one of two ways, where the host immune system destroys the pathogen. And I'm talking about where we're not giving drugs because uh, drugs could also end the pathogen. 
or the, the host could die. And that's how the illness could end. And that's the way many HIV patients died. They got AIDS and then they died. With modern medication now, we are keeping AIDS patients alive for a good long time. Uh, there are patients alive in their 70s who uh, have had HIV since what, the 1990s or earlier. So that's over 30 years now. All right, any questions about any of that? If not, I'm gonna stop here and we'll continue here for the next lesson. So if there's no questions, I'm gonna end this now. And if you have questions, show up in the lab at 6.30 to 6.45. I will leave at 6.45 unless there are questions. All right, goodbye.